Today's lecture is going to be about the Green's theorem and surface integral. Why don't we start with the first one right here, Green's theorem. In a nutshell, Green's theorem is all about how you transform a lined integral into a double integral. And that is the core idea of this theorem. So let's write that down. You start with a lined integral. Okay, lined integral right here. Let's also write down the formula for the line integral. Let's put it right here. So we have the integration along a certain path in the space. Okay? Of course, this is line integral. You have to follow a certain path. Okay? And we are going to perform the integration of the vector field, big F. And let's assume that this one is for the two-dimensional space. So we only have x and y as the coordinates. And dot with the differential step in the space, ds. This one is also a vector. Oh, by the way, this formula is covered maybe a few lectures back. So if you forgot about this formula, you can always look that up. All right, so back to this formula. Now we have this complete formula for the line integral. And for some reason, today we are not happy with this line integral. Maybe the computation is too hard, maybe the calculation is too complicated to deal with. So we want to transform this line integral into a different kind of integral, and that is double integral. So we are not happy with this, so we want to make this happen. Transform this line integral into a double integral. Now, the question is, why do we need to make this transformation happen? And the reason for that is because most of the time, the calculation for the line integrals tends to be more complicated and more complex than that of the double integral. And the reason for that, once again, is because we need to follow a certain path in the space. And in order to follow a certain path in the space, you need to do parametrization. If you can recall, when we use this formula right here, we cannot use it directly. We have to parametrize this formula into a different form. So we parametrize this into differential r in terms of t. All right, and we parametrize this into a vector field big F in terms of t. All right, and that is, that is the reason. So let's make a note right here. Tend to be harder to do harder to execute. And the reason for that is because of the parametrization that is required. Due to parametrization. All right, since this is hard, so we want to somehow change this into something that is simpler. And most of the time, double integral tends to be more simple and straightforward. Not always, but most of the time. So let's make a note again right here. Tends to be more simple and straightforward. All right, so that is the, uh, the reason why we want to do this. But the thing is, this transformation is not always possible. It's only possible when some certain special condition is met. All right? So make sure that you know that this is only possible when a condition is met, a special one. So we need this condition for this transformation. And when we have this uh, condition right here, Green's theorem is going to come into play. It's going to allow us to make this transformation. All right, so when we have this condition, it's when we use the Green's theorem. Okay, so that is the main idea of the Green's theorem, transforming a line integral into a double integral to make the calculation easier. Now, let's take a look into the components of this formula that we have right here for the line integral. So let's take a look at the components of the uh, vector field big F. So let's write that down right here. So we have this vector field big F with x and y as coordinates. We are going to look into the components of this. So this one is for two-dimensional space, so we have i and j. 
And since this is a regular vector field, each component has to be has to uh, has the freedom to be anything it, uh, it can be. So we can choose any sub function for each component. So I can use m sub function x y for i component plus n sub function of x y j component. All right. So that is that is the uh, vector field big F in terms of components. Now let's take a look at the components of differential step ds right here. So we talked about this one. Let's move to this one. We would like to see this ds in terms of i and j component. Now let's take a look at this ds right here. This ds is just a vector, a small vector, tiny vector in the space. All right. And we want to see this vector in terms of i and j component. And one way to do that is to project this ds into x-axis and y-axis and find those components. So we are going to project this ds onto x-axis. And we are going to get this. OK, let's put this in red. All right, this one is going to be the component of um, x-axis. So it's going to be dx. I. And let's project this same vector onto the y axis. All right, something like this. And we are going to get this vector. All right, and we are going to call this dyj, j component of ds. And when you add these two, dyj and dxi, you are going to get this vector ds. So we can express this ds right here in terms of i and j components. So this is equal to dxi plus dyj. All right. So now let's find the dot product between them because we want to check this out. F dot ds. So let's find that. F of xy dot ds is going to be equal to the product of each component summed together. All right, so let's find the uh, first product for the i component. It's going to be mdx. So here we get the first product, mdx, plus the component of the second, uh, uh, sorry, the product of the second component, and that is ndy. But there you go. So we have this f.ds, and we are going to substitute this back into the formula. It's going to go into here. So we are going to get another form of the uh, line integral. It's going to be equal to integration along a certain path in the space. And we are going to move everything that we just got into here. And we have this mdx plus ndy. So this is another form of the uh, line integral, another formula, but it's actually equivalent. So let's make a note here that these two are equivalent. OK, so you can use either one. The first one is expressed in terms of a dot product, a complete vector. But the second one is, is expressed in terms of components of each uh, vector. So that depends on you which one you want to use. All right, so we have two versions right here, one dot product and two in terms of components. Now, back to the Green's theorem. Let's talk about that. I told you guys that Green's theorem is all about how you want to transform a line integral into a double integral, but you need a certain condition to be met. Let's talk about that condition. OK, so we have this condition right here. What is this special condition that we need for Green's theorem? And it turns out to be just one condition. So let's take a look here. It requires path C, this path C of the line integral, to be closed loop and simple. So let's write that down. Path C must be closed loop. and simple. OK, now just one statement for this condition. And let's take a look at the closed loop. 
by now we know what a closed loop looks like when it comes to a path in the space. So, a path C that is closed loop is when you start at a certain point in space. All right, let's call this point P. And you perform a, a line integral along a certain path C. And it has to come back to the original location. All right, so this kind of path C is closed loop. The keyword is coming back to the original location, and you get a closed loop path. Now, this simple one right here, this simple property, this one is new. All right, so let's make a note. Path C is simple when there is no crossing over the path. All right, so this simple right here means that no crossing. Okay, so if you have a path like this, from A to B, all right, A to B, this one is simple. But if you have a path from A to B, but it looks like this, you have a crossing right here, then this is not simple. Okay, so let's put A and B right here. And let's make a note that this one is simple because there is no crossing. This one is not because we have crossing here, one of them right here. So make a note here that is, this is not simple because of this crossing, okay? Now, back to the condition that we have, path C must be closed loop and simple, which means that we are going to have a loop without crossing. So let's take a look at some examples right here. This one, if your path looks like this, then this is uh, this one right here. This one is a loop and there is no crossing, so this one is good. Condition C is met. All right. Next one right here, we have a loop and no crossing, so condition C is also met. But this one right here, we have a closed loop. It comes back to the original location, but we have a crossing right here. So this one is not simple. So for this one, condition C is not met. Okay. So, in order to use the Green's theorem, make sure that your path C for the line integral, you start with a line integral, and path C must be closed loop and simple. And once this condition is met, you can use the following formula. So let's take a look at this formula, the full formula for the Green's theorem. So this one right here. So you start with a line integral. Let's use the new form that we just derived today. So we have this line integral along a certain path, all right, and we have m dx plus n dy. Make a note that this one is line integral that for some reason we are not happy with today. And for some reason, it turns out that we have this path C right here to be closed loop and simple. Okay, and let's put this circle right here to indicate that this is closed loop. If you have this condition, then you can transform this line integral into this double integral. And it's going to be equal to this double integral of partial derivative of n. n is coming from this j component of f. All right, partial derivative of n with respect to x minus partial derivative of m, and m came from this, right here, i component of the vector field with respect to y. Okay. All right, and you need to integrate this, these two terms with respect to the differential area, dA. We have covered this in the double integral over an integration domain r. All right, so that is the transformation. And once again, it's only possible when you have this closed loop and simple path. All right. Now, for this dA, once again, this dA can be either dx dy or dy dx. dx dy or dy dx. It depends on the situation. By now, you know that in some certain condition, some order, a certain order is, gonna, is going to work better for this dA. All right, so you need to pick whether this dA is dx dy or dy dx. 
Now, when it comes to the integration domain R, what is this integration domain R? This R right here is going to correspond to the region trapped inside the closed loop. So this R right here is going to be this region. All right. The region trapped inside the closed loop. This will correspond to this integration domain R. Same with this. All right. So make a note right here that this is region trapped in closed loop R, oh, closed loop C. Okay, there you go. So that is it. That is the transformation that we need. But there is one extra condition for this formula to work. So let's make a note right here. In order for this formula to work, path C that you are working with must circulate in counterclockwise direction. All right. Path C must, very important, circulate or rotate in counterclockwise direction, CCW. All right. So what about the case when the circulation is clockwise? Then the formula is going to be a little bit different. So let's add that to uh, this formula right here. This is when the circulation is clockwise the formula is going to be pretty much the same except that we have this minus sign at the front. So everything is pretty much the same double integral of nx minus my with respect to dA differential area over the same uh, integration domain R but we have this minus sign at the front All right. so this one is going to be for the case when the path C by the way, this is supposed to be path C. Okay, path C. The second one is when path C is circulating in clockwise direction. Path C circulate in clockwise direction. Okay, so this is the uh, full formula for the Green's theorem. Let's put a box around this. Okay, and same down here. All the way through. And there you go. You have the complete formula for the Green's theorem. And at this point, you know that it can only be used when this special condition right here is met. With a closed loop and simple path C. Before we continue, I need to let you know that I gave you this formula directly without proving it. And that is because I would like to focus on the use and the application of this theorem. The proof of this theorem is actually quite long and quite challenging, but I am not going to cover that in this lecture. However, I am going to provide you with some links in the description that can lead you to some online videos that prove this Green's theorem. So in case you want to know where this formula comes from, you can follow those links. Okay, so let's move on to some examples in the next slide. Let's start with example number one right here. So let's take a look at the information that we have. So we have this right vector field, big F. Oh, by the way, this is a typo. Let's take out this Z right here. Okay, we don't have this Z uh, coordinate because we only have I and J component. Right? So this one is a vector field in two-dimensional space, so please take Z out. All right, so we have this vector field, and we are supposed to find the line integral. So the question is about the line integral along this curve right here. So we have this curve, and as you can see, this curve has already been parameterized. So this is expressed in terms of T. So this is quite convenient because this, is, uh, this has already been parameterized parameterized okay with variable t time <clears throat> all right and time ranges from 0 to 2 pi so this question is about the line integral what about we start with the traditional way the the method that we learned a few lectures back to solve the line integral directly okay method 1 we are going to solve this line integral 
directly. Okay, so we are going to start with the formula for this uh, method one, and I am going to bring back the formula that we used uh, maybe two weeks ago. It's this formula right here line integral along a certain path C of the vector field. Okay, let's start with this one in terms of x and y dot ds. All right, so we had this. We also had this in the previous slide. But then we perform the parameterization, change this into dr of t, and change this vector field into a vector field f in terms of t. So in the end, we have this formula instead, um, line integral along a certain path of vector field bf in terms of t dot uh, derivative of r in terms of t with respect to t. All right, and we are going to integrate this with respect to time. If you forgot about this formula, you can always look that up. So we are going to stick with this formula for this example and method one. Okay, so we need this uh, vector field in terms of time. We also need the first order derivative of r with respect to time. So why don't we start with the uh, vector field in terms of time? We need to parameterize this vector field that we have in terms of x, y, to, and change it into in terms of t. So let's start with the curve that we have. We have this curve right here. Curve that we have, parameterized curve, r of t equal to cosine t i plus sine t j. So this, um, this parameterized equation right here shows the uh, position of the point in the space. This is the curve in the space. So make sure that you know that this is curve in space and time ranges from 0 to 2 pi. And as you can see here, we have two components, i and j, which means, which means that the component for i is going to correspond to the x coordinate along the curve. So this one right here, cosine t, is the x coordinate. All right, so let's put it this way. This one is x coordinate along curve. And this one right here, sine t, is going to be y coordinate along curve. So we have this x right here and y right here. So we have this relation. x is going to be equal to cosine t along the curve. And y is going to be equal to sine t along the curve. And we are going to use this in the uh, vector field big F. So let's start with the vector field big F. We have this F right here equal to our uh, xy equal to x minus y i first component plus xj second component. And we want to change this into a vector field in terms of time, right, in terms of t equal to and by now we know that x will correspond to cosine t along the curve. So let's bring that right here. I'm going to use black. Okay, so what about this? f of t equal to x right here is going to be equal to cosine t. And y right here equal to sine t. So there you go. That is the first component of this vector in terms of time. Plus x right here equal to cosine t. All right, so this is a j component. So I got this term, vector field in terms of time. Now I need the first order derivative of r in terms of, uh, with respect to time. So I am going to diff this with respect to time. So let's do that. dr diff this curve with respect to time. So I'm going to dip this, cosine t, it's going to be minus sine t. Component by component, I get this minus sine t i, and then I dip this, sine t right here. With respect to time, I get cosine t, plus cosine t j. 
So there you go. I got the second term for this formula. And now I need to perform the dot product between them. Okay, dot product right here. So let's find the product of each component and let's add them together. So start with the first component. That's going to be this one right here times with this one right here. So let's find that. That's going to be f of t dot dr of t with respect to time equal to first product minus sine t cosine t and plus sine t square. All right. And now let's find the second product of the second component. This one and okay. Right, this one and this one. It's going to be plus cosine t squared. Plus cosine t squared. So there you go. That is f dot dr by dt. And I see this one right here. Sine squared plus cosine squared. This is going to be equal to 1. So I'm going to get this 1 minus sine t cosine t. But I am not happy with this term right here because I need to integrate this. And I don't like it when we have this uh, two function multiplied together. It's kind of hard to deal with. So I'm going to use trigonometry property to combine them into just one function. And this one right here is going to be equal to sine 2t over 2. Right? So with the double angle, so I can change this into 1 minus sine of 2t over 2 and that is equal to the f dot dr by dt and it's this term right here that we just got is going to go into this formula so let's split this screen right in the middle okay so we have this integration all right and ft dot uh, f dot dr is going to be equal to 1 minus sine 2t divided by 2. Integrate this with respect to time. And now integration has to range from time equal to 0 to time equal to 2 pi, coming from here. Time starts at 0 and ends at 2 pi. All right. At this point, it should be straightforward. It's going to be equal to. Alright, so this is going to be equal to t minus, oh, integrate this, sine 2t is going to be equal to minus cosine 2t over 2. So this is going to become positive. Cosine 2t over 2 with the remaining 2, it's going to be 4 right here. And I need to evaluate this at two values of t, 0 and 2 pi. Alright, so 2 pi goes in, I get 2 pi plus cosine of 4 pi over 4 minus 0 goes in, 0 plus cosine of 0 over 4. Okay, so this one is going to be equal to 1. So this whole term is going to be equal to 1 over 4, 1 quarter. Same thing here, this one equal to 1, cosine 0. This whole term is going to be equal to 1 over 4. So we have this 2 pi plus 1 over 4 minus 1 over 4. And this cancel with that. So in the end, we have this 2 pi as the final answer for this line integral. And we just use the traditional way to solve this. Use the uh, uh, formula for the line integral. Okay, now we are going to try a new method that we learned today for this same example in the next slide. Okay, method two. And we are going to find out whether the, uh, the answer comes out to be the same. So method two, we are going to try Green's theorem. Try Green's theorem. But the Green's theorem can only be used when the path C of the line integral is closed loop and simple. However, at this point, we still don't know yet whether the path C of the line integral in this example number one has this condition or not. So the first thing that we are supposed to do before we apply the Green's theorem is to check the path C in this example. 
and we are going to check this R of T right here. Parametrized curve, which is the curve that we are going to take for the uh, line integral. So we are going to check this. Right, this one is path C, and we check whether this path C is closed loop and simple or not. So we are going to check on this one. All right. So the only way to find out about this is to plot this curve on a graph. So let's do that on a graph on this uh, left-hand side. So let's build a graph right here of this RT. So let's have y-axis, okay, and also x-axis. All right, y-axis and x-axis. Let's bring down the parameterized curve down here. It's going to be r of t at any time equal to cosine t i first component plus sine t j second component. And looking at this, we know that the range of the time goes from zero, starts at zero, and ends at two pi. All right. So this is going to be the path C that we take for this example. Now let's find out about this path in the space. Let's start with the, uh, the point at time equal to zero. Let's find out about the coordinate at that time. So let's find this position vector at time equal to zero, equal to cosine of zero, we get one, i, right? And sine of zero, we get zero, j. And this corresponds to the coordinate, uh, one, zero, at time equal to zero. And it's going to be this point right here, all right? One, okay, let's write this up here. This point one zero happens at time equal to zero at the start of time. Now, what if we increase this time to be uh, one step further? Let's check the time equal to pi over two. All right. Position vector at time equal to pi over two. All right, it's going to be equal to cosine of pi over 2, that's going to be 0, i, plus sine of pi over 2, that's going to be 1, j. And of course, this corresponds to the coordinate 0 and 1 at time equal to pi over 2. And it's going to be this point right here. This point at 1, 0 and also at time equal to pi over 2. Let's try one more. Position vector at time equal to pi. All right. So position vector r at time equal to pi equal to cosine of pi that is minus 1. i plus sine of pi that is 0. j. Of course, we have this coordinate of minus 1 and 0 happens at time equal to pi. All right. Now, we are going to start at this point. At this point right here, at time equal to 0. And then, uh, with one step, we are going to appear at, pi, uh, at 1, 0, pi over 2. But along the way, it's going to travel along the circumference of a circle of radius 1. So it's going to travel like this, starting at this point along the circumference of the circle, something like this, okay? And then at time equal to pi, it's going to show up at this point, right? Minus one, of, uh, minus one zero. This is when time equal to pi. So this curve is going to keep continue, uh, continue to this point down here, and at time equal to 3 pi over 2, it's going to be at this point. 0 minus 1 at time equal to 3 pi over 2. So this curve is going to uh, continue down here to this point and it keeps going until it reaches t equal to pi, uh, 2 pi. At this point, at the end, at time equal to 2 pi it's back to the original location.
So the flow of this um, of this curve is going to start at this point, and it's going to follow this path in this direction. All right, and when time reaches two pi, it's going to be back at the original coordinate of one zero. Okay, so that is the curve that we have right here. And right away, we know that this one is closed loop. So at this point, we know right away that this one is definitely closed loop because it goes back to the original location, the starting point. And it's also simple because it has no crossing. All right, so this one is also simple. Okay, so. This means that we have this condition, special condition for the Green's theorem. And right now, we are confident to use the Green's theorem with this example. So with this condition that we see right here, we definitely can use the Green's theorem to solve the line integral of this example. Can use Green's theorem. All right, so that's good news. So let's use that. All right, let's start with the uh, formula for the Green's theorem. Okay, so let's bring the, um, the formula down here. From the previous slide, we have this formula. Okay, integration, line integral. So we have this formula, right, line integral of m dx plus n dy and along the path C that we have right here. And it turns out to be a closed loop and simple. Right? And to use the Green's theorem, this is going to be equal to the um, double integral of the partial derivative of n with respect to x minus partial derivative of m with respect to y, and integrate this with respect to the differential area over the integration domain R. Now, the question is, we need to determine the sign right here, whether it's supposed to be a positive or negative. And this is going to be determined by the direction of the uh, closed loop path. So we need to check the direction of the circulation. Looking at this circulation, we can see right away that this is the uh, counterclockwise direction. So what you see right here, this is definitely counterclockwise, CCW. And when the direction is counterclockwise, we are going to um, use the positive version of the formula. So we don't need to put anything here. All right. But if the circulation is clockwise, then you are supposed to have the minus sign at the front of the double integral. So at this point, this formula is good. Oh, by the way, this is the Green's theorem. OK. Now, we can solve this line integral m dx plus n dy by solving the double integral instead. So we are going to solve this. So we are going to need this nx and my. All right, so let's check about the n and, n and m that we have right here. n is going to be this coefficient right here, the coefficient for the j component of the vector field bf. So this one right here, x, is going to be the n function, n sub function, n of x, y, and the coefficient of the i component, this one, x minus y, is going to be the sub function m, m of x, y. And by the way, you are supposed to take this out. We don't have z here. All right, so let's work on these two. We have this m of x, y equal to x minus y. And we also have n of x, y equal to x. So let's start with this one. We are supposed to find the first order derivative of n with respect to x. So let's diff n with respect to x. Okay, Diff n with respect to x, we get 1. And this is n with respect to x. All right. Now for the m, for the second one, m with respect to y, let's find that. We diff this m right here with respect to y, and we get minus 1, and this is m with respect to y. 
and we are going to put these two back into the formula. So we are going to have this double integration, integration domain R. Oh, by the way, oh, I can talk about this R later. So let's put nx and my in place. So nx equal to 1 right here. 1 minus my equal to minus 1. So this is equal to minus 1. And we integrate this with respect to the differential area, dA. Once again, this dA can be either dx dy or dy dx. dx dy or dy dx. But just leave it as differential area for now. Let's talk about this r right here. Once again, this r is going to be the region trapped inside the closed loop uh, path. So this one, region of closed loop path C, all right? And it's going to correspond to this area right here. This integration domain is going to be trapped inside the closed loop path. So it's going to be this circle of radius 1 with the center at the origin, OK? So let's work this out. This is going to combine into 2. And I'm going to move this constant in front of the integral. So in the end, I have this 2 in front and double integral of the differential area of the integration domain R. All right. Now, when you look at this, this corresponds to the area of the integration domain R. All right because we don't have any function inside. We only have this uh, hidden one right here. So this corresponds to the area of R. Right? And this is a circle of radius 1. So it's going to be equal to pi of 1 square. And that's equal to pi, this whole circle right here. So in the end, the whole integral comes out to be equal to 2 pi. And that is the answer of this example, number 1, by using the method 2, by using the Green's theorem. And you can see that the result is the same as what we got from the, uh, the method 1. In terms of the calculation, to me, I think the, um, the method 2 is much more manageable, much more straightforward, and easier to execute. But once again, you need to be able to realize that the shape of the curve is closed loop and simple and that's why you can use Green's theorem to make this calculation easier. Now let's move to the example number two down here. In this example number two we are supposed to find the line integral in the presence of a vector field and we have this vector field big F right here and it's one in two dimensional space because we have x and y as the coordinates and of course we have i and j components. So this one in 2D. And we are supposed to find the line integral along a certain path. So let me give you that path. I am going to draw this diagram on the left-hand side right here. So let's have y-axis. OK, and also x-axis. OK, good enough. x and y. And this path is going to start at the origin right here at 0, 0. And it's going to follow a straight line um, and gets to the point 1, 1. So along this straight line to the point 1, 1. OK, that is not so good. So let me fix that. So maybe something like this is better. OK, this is better. So it gets to this point 1, 1. So it's going to travel from 0, 0 to 1, 1 along this straight line. And this point is at y equal to 1 and x equal to 1. And once it gets to 1, 1, it's going to make a turn and comes straight down to x-axis. Once it gets to um, 1, 1, it's going to go down here to x-axis. Go straight down. All right. 1, 0 comes straight down. 
and then it's going to make another turn and head for the origin. Okay, along this line and back to the original location. So there you go. So this is the whole path that we need to take in order to find the line integral for this example. And we are going to call this whole path, including all of these three straight lines, path C. All of them. The whole path is path C. And now we want to find the line integral along this path. So let's bring the formula for the line integral. And it's going to be this integration along this path C, along three straight lines, m dx plus n dy. Right. Now, m is going to be the um, sub-function for the i component of the vector field. So it's going to be this, y squared. So let's write down that m of xy sub-function is going to be equal to the i component, which is y squared. And n, xy, is going to be the component for j. And that is equal to xy. Okay. Now, we want to find this line integral. And let's assume for now that we want to solve this traditionally. We want to solve this using the traditional line integral. And that means that we have to follow the path strictly from 0 to 0, to 1, 1, to 1, 0, and then to 0, 0. But as you can see here, this whole path C, this whole triangle, is consisted of three subsections. And each subsection is described by different equation. So let's take a look here. Let's take a look at the first section, the straight line from 0, 0 to, uh, to 1, 1. And let's call this uh, section C1. All right. This line is going to describe to be described by y equal to x. All right. So that's a straight line. And now for the second section, from 1, 1 to 1, 0. Let's call that C2. And C2 is described by x equal to 1, constant value of uh, 1, constant value of x. All right, and the last section on the uh, x-axis, let's call that C3. And this section, it's going to be this equation right here, y equal to 0, or x-axis. As you can see here, each section has its own equation, which means that it's not possible to use just one integral to include them all. So, in order to find the line integral along this whole path C, we need to split the integral into three separate um, integrals, work on each one of them individually, and then in the end, we add them all together. Okay? So we need to split the integral split this, this path C into C1, C2, and C3, and work on each one of them. So let's do that. Let's start with the first one. Line integral along C1, okay? This same mdx plus ndy, plus the second section, line integral along C2, mdx plus ndy, and the last section, along C3, mdx plus ndy. Now, let's try to parameterize this whole path C. Let's put a timestamp into the whole path so that we know that each point happens at what time. So let's assume that this starting point happens at time equal to 0. OK, t equal to 0 at the origin. And when time equal to 1, it gets to this point, 1, 1. And when time equal to 2, it gets to this point. And when time equal to 3, back to the origin. OK. Which means that for the first section, C1, it's going to be for, from t equal to 0 to 1. So for this section, it's going to be t from 0 to 1. For this section 2, it's going to be t from 1 to 2. And last section, t from 2 to 3. Now, let's try to uh, find the parameterized line for each uh, section that we have here. Each C1, C2, C3 is going to have different line 
parameterized line. So let's start with the C1. So C1 is going to have this R1. Okay, parameterized with the T variable. And it's going to be this um, equation, this uh, vector Ti, Ti plus Tj, as you can see with this position vector, when time equal to zero, this is going to uh, correspond to the coordinate zero, zero. And when time equal to one, it's going to correspond to the coordinate one, one. So we get what we want here from zero, zero to one, one. Now for the second section, it's going to be this uh, parameterized line R2. R2 of t is going to be equal to i plus 2 minus t j. All right, let's try to put some numbers in. When time equal to 1, we get this coordinate 1, 1. All right, 1 goes in, we get 1, 1. But if time equal to 2, we get 1, 0. So exactly what we want. We start at 1, 1 and ends at 1, 0. Okay, and now last one, R3, parameterized line is going to be equal to 3 minus Tj, oh sorry, 3 minus Ti, 3 minus Ti, as you can see here, if you put 2 in, you are going to get 1, 0. But if you put 3 in, you are going to get 0, 0. So exactly this point. Start at 1, 0 on the graph and ends at 0, 0 for C3. And as you can see, each one of them has different parameterized line. And that's why we need to perform the line integral three times and then add them all in the end. And that's a lot of work, right? So since today we learned about the Green's theorem, and maybe we try to use that. First of all, let's, try, uh, let's find out whether we can use the Green's theorem for this example number two. So let's check whether the path C that we have here, the whole path, has this special condition that we uh, talked about before. So we need to check whether it's closed loop and simple. So let's take a look here. This one is definitely closed loop because it comes back to the original location and since there is no crossing, we are sure that this one is definitely closed loop and simple. So make a note right here from, from the look of this, definitely closed loop and simple. Okay, which means that we can definitely use the Green's theorem to solve this problem. Okay, can use Green's theorem. Okay, before anything, let's take a look at the uh, rotation of this um, path that we have here, the circulation, the direction that we have. And as you can see here, this direction that we have is clockwise. Okay, so we have this clockwise direction. So keep that in mind when you apply the Green's theorem formula. Okay, now we are going to uh, start with the Green's theorem. Okay, let's bring the uh, formula to this uh, slide. So let's start with the formula. So we want to perform this line integral along this whole path C, m dx and dy. But we don't want to separate the integral into three parts like we had up, up there. So we want to use the Green's theorem and we are going to transform this into a double integral. And since we have this clockwise direction, the formula that we have right here would have this minus sign at the front. Okay, double integral of n dx. Oh, I'm sorry. Partial diff of n with respect to x. Sorry about that. Partial diff of n with respect to x minus partial diff of m with respect to y. Perform the integration with respect to differential area. dA over the uh, integration domain r. All right. Now let's find nx and my. So let's work 
over here. M x y equal to y squared. So m y dm by dy is going to be equal to 2y. Now n x y equal to x y. All right. So dn by dx is going to be equal to y. So what you have right here is m y, and this one right here is n x. Now, let's take a look at this differential area. In terms of differential area, you can choose between dx dy or dy dx. Okay? What about I choose one? I'm going to go with dx dy, which means that I am going to sweep the x variable first. Right? Let's make a note. Sweep x variable first. You can choose dy dx if you want. Now for this r, once again this r is going to be the region trapped inside the closed loop path C. <coughs> okay, region closed loop C. And it's going to be this region. So this is going to be the region that we want to perform the double integral on. Okay, so we let's work on this a little bit further. So let's put everything right here. It's going to be equal to minus double integral of nx, which is equal to y okay, nx equal to y and my equal to 2y. And I chose the dx dy. Right. And the next thing I'm supposed to do is to determine the boundaries for each variable. So I need to know the starting point of x equal to what? End point for x equal to what? Starting point for y equal to what? And end point for y equal to what? So I am going to sweep x variable first. So I am going to get this sweeping pattern from left to right. From left to right left to right, left to right, all the way through, which means that I am going to start from this line right here. This is the starting point for the sweeping, the left hand side, and this is the end point for the sweeping, the right hand side. So in the end, I am going to cover the whole region. So the left hand side, this corresponds to this equation right here. So the starting point is this line, so I know that x equal to y is the uh, left boundary for this sweeping. And the right boundary is going to be this green line right here, which is x equal to 1. So I can put 1 right here for the end point for the sweeping of x variable. And now for y variable, it's going to be the whole range, starting from 0 and ends at 1. Starting from 0 and ends at 1. So I can just put it right here, 0 and 1. All right. So this is going to be equal to minus y, and it's going to cancel with that. So in the end, I have this integration double of just y, dx dy, x equal to y, x equal to 1, y equal to 0, and y equal to 1. Now at this point, it's going to be just double integral. So let's integrate this with respect to x. So I am going to get this yx, and I need to evaluate this at two values of x, x equal to y and x equal to 1. And then I need to integrate this one more time with respect to y from 0 to 1. All right. So 1 goes in, we have this y and y goes in, we have this minus y squared. And I am supposed to integrate this with respect to y from 0 to 1. This one is easy. It's going to be equal to y squared over 2 minus y cubed over 3. Evaluate this at two values of y, 0 and 1. It's going to be equal to 1 over 2 minus 1 over 3. And 
in the end, we get this as the answer equal to 1 over 6. What about I put, it, put this right here? 1 over 6. Okay, there you go. That is the answer for this example number 2. So instead of having to go through all of this computation, right here, all three of them, since we know Green's theorem, we have found a better way, an easier way to solve this um, line integral problem.